Tonight, the Republican nomination, now a two-person race. Who thinks that Donald Trump is going to win on Tuesday? I don't want him to win, but I, I think it's wishful thinking that he's not. With Ron DeSantis out, Donald Trump and Nikki Haley seek last-minute votes for the New Hampshire primary as the race for the Republican presidential nomination converges onto the Granite State. Can Haley pull off a win with DeSantis now out? We have all the political coverage tonight with the polls opening just hours from now. And... A Supreme Court win impacting the southern border as the Biden administration faces growing calls to tackle what opponents say is a migrant crisis in this country. The Supreme Court hands him a narrow victory. Why parts of the border fence in Texas could start being removed immediately and what happens next. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including the bone chilling temperatures still gripping much of the country as flooding hits the West Coast where rescues had to be conducted. Plus tonight, U.S. and British forces launch another major attack on Iranian backed militants at multiple targets across Yemen and why the FEAA is now recommending that hundreds more Boeing planes be inspected. But we do begin with the first in the nation, New Hampshire primary just hours away, and the race to the finish in a GOP campaign that is now down to just two, Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. And tonight, many are saying the live free or die state may be do or die for Nikki Haley. Haley's been barnstorming the state for weeks, trying to win over voters and make the case she is the only one who can beat Biden. But polls still have her down more than 10 points to former president. President Trump. This became a two-person race, as Haley likes to put it, between a fella and a lady. After Florida Governor Ron DeSantis dropped out on Sunday and endorsed Trump, Trump has been telling crowds in New Hampshire to expect a victory so decisive that it ends the primary. So what are the keys to winning in New Hampshire? Our team is standing by to break it all down, and we begin with our congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, who's on the trail for us in New Hampshire. Kirsten, it's nice Good to see you. Tonight in New Hampshire, it's do or die for Nikki Haley. She wanted a one on one matchup with Donald Trump, and now she's got it. So we're going to do this. Get out tomorrow. Take five friends with you. In the final hours, Haley crisscrossing the state with New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu. It is now a two person race. And what that means is your decision tomorrow is do we want more of the same? Or do we want a new generational leader? Haley insisting Trump and President Biden are just too old for the job. And she's seizing on this moment. Trump confusing her with Nancy Pelosi when talking about January 6th. Nikki Haley is in charge of security. We offered her 10,000 people, soldiers, National Guard, so whatever they want. Haley pounced. When you're dealing with the pressures of a presidency, we can't have someone else that we question whether they're mentally fit to do this. Trump, meantime, has turned to mocking Haley's Indian first name, Nimrata, highlighting it and misspelling it again and again. It's a little bit of a takeoff on her name, you know, her name, wherever she may come from. Haley was born in South Carolina. She told me Trump's attacks are proof she's getting to him. This is what he does when he starts to feel insecure. This is what he does when he feels threatened. One thing is clear. With Florida Governor Ron DeSantis out of the race, Haley is now the only candidate standing between Trump and the Republican nomination. And here in New Hampshire, she's counting on independent voters like Deborah Barubi, a cook at a hospital. She tells me she's undecided, but... It's probably going to be Nikki. Why Nikki? Because I think it's time for a big change. <laughs> Huge. So why not Trump? After all he's done now, we don't need it. Lindsay, Nikki Haley is betting on a strong showing in this state, but she's still trailing former President Donald Trump by double digits. She told me that win or lose here in New Hampshire, she's going on to her home state of South Carolina. Lindsay, that's still more than a month away. Lindsay. Our thanks to Rachel Scott. And for more now, let's bring in our political director, Rick Klein. Rick, another long night ahead tomorrow. And yeah. you're going to be at the big boards with us uh, all night. Uh, just give us a sense of what a victory looks like for Nikki Haley. And is this kind of do or die in the live free or die state? You hate to say this with only the second state up, but it kind of is. We're down to the two-person race that Nikki Haley always said that she wanted. Now she has to deliver. And I think the thought of a win has sort of faded away. I don't think anyone realistically thinks that she can actually win. The polling has dropped for her in, in relation to Trump to the 12, 13-point range in a bunch of places. If she can keep it to single digits, if she can come close, maybe she brands herself as the comeback 
kid and says, look what I was able to do. If you stitch together the right kind of voters, you can make that argument going forward. But if she has blown out anything like the, the, the Trump's victory last week, I just don't see how there's a path forward for her any more than it was for Ron DeSantis or Chris Christie or the other candidates have already fallen by the wayside. And, and to your point, she has what she wants, that two-person race, as she likes to say, one guy, one fellow One left. fellow, yeah. And so at this point, does she need independent voters to really have a big turnout tomorrow? Yeah, that's what I have my eye on more, more than anything else. It, New Hampshire is different than Iowa and different than a lot of states in that independence, people that don't affiliate with either party, they can vote in either primary they want. And this time, with, with Joe Biden running for re-election, although there's some odd things on that too. The Democrats don't have that much reason to show up uh, as much as they normally would. So if she is able to drive up that vote share, get a lot of independent voters out there, the last time that we saw anything near this was 2012 when Obama was running for re-election. That year, 45% of the Republican voters were actually independents. Those are probably Haley voters, just like the core Republicans are probably Trump voters. That is really the problem that she has overall is that Republicans like Trump a lot. So she has to draw other people into the party. That's hard to do in a primary, but New Hampshire makes it l much easier than other places. That's the key thing to watch tomorrow night. Well, we've really been focusing on this Republican aspect of yeah. all of this, but there is a Democratic primary as well. And what, you have to write in Joe Biden's name? Yeah, this is kind of a sleeper story, I think, going into the night. So the Biden campaign is is basically trying to play it both ways. Uh, the, the, the Democrats have said that New Hampshire actually doesn't count for delegates. And if you apply to be on the ballot there, you don't get any delegates. So other candidates did, Dean Phillips, Marion Williamson, they're on the ballot. The Biden team says, we're not doing that, but they, have, they haven't they have exactly discouraged the attempts to write in Joe Biden. There's been a whole raft of senators and governors and congressmen who've been up in New Hampshire encouraging people, write in Joe Biden. They don't want to see him embarrassed. They don't want to see him blown out. And that does set a bit of a bar for him. This will be the first gauge anywhere in the country this year about really what Joe Biden's standing is in the Democratic Party. If he is able to, to win a resounding victory with a write-in, that's a pretty good statement here early in the process. If he's got a sweat of it all and Dean Phillips or Marianne Williamson ends up getting a big vote share, I think the Biden campaign is going to have to ask how that happened. It, as far as from going from Iowa to New Hampshire, we're talking about how they're two totally different yeah. uh, states as far as the demographic makeup. But obviously, you know, Trump won with like, what, 50 percent of the margin. Yeah. What kind of expectation are we thinking, looking into our crystal balls for, for New Hampshire for Trump. It's so odd because he won Iowa by 30 points when he actually lost eight years ago. New Hampshire, he won by almost 20 points eight years ago, but he won it in a much different position with a very scattered field. This is a one-on-one -on -one race right now, and he's going to make the case, look at the core Republicans I got. I think if he wins anything, you know, in, in the double digits or more, 15, 20 points plus, that's going to not just be a victory, but a statement. If he's got to worry at all about the, the voters that are into the process, then it's on to South Carolina. Haley's home state, but Trump's pretty popular there as well. So you got about a month be between those two states. Uh, but we're going to learn a lot about how long this primary might be, whether it might be over essentially before it started. We may not even really have a big Super Tuesday. It may not be that anymore. super. We'll see. This is the unusual election cycle. Rick, thank you. you of course, we're going to see a lot tomorrow night. Our in-depth coverage and analysis of the New Hampshire primary begins tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live. Now to the deadly winter storms across the country as we track yet a new system moving east. Snow, ice and record cold are already being blamed for at least 75 deaths in 13 states this month alone. Rescuers saved a driver who skidded off the road, leaving his pickup truck dangling over a 200-foot cliff outside of Nashville. And heavy rain caused flash flooding in San Diego, with up to three inches falling in the span of three hours. Our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, is tracking what comes next, but Trevor Alt leads us off with our storm coverage. Tonight, that 28-ton fire truck spinning out of control on icy roads near St. Louis. Watch again, firefighters responding to a call, losing traction, striking a vehicle and coming to a stop. Luckily, no one was hurt, but that dangerous ice storm is making travel treacherous across the heartland. AccuWeather capturing streets covered in ice outside Oklahoma City. The back roads especially are incredibly slick. There's about a quarter inch of ice accretion that happened overnight from multiple waves of freezing rain. On Lake Erie, east of Toledo, a race to rescue 20 people stranded on an ice floe a half mile from shore. The Coast Guard and local authorities rushing to the scene, everyone making it back to land safely. 
tragically the death toll rising from weeks of winter storms at least 75 people killed across 13 states many from hypothermia and car crashes in Memphis where a boil water advisory remains in effect residents like Carolyn Mayfield going several days without water I'm literally going outside getting snow melting it and putting it in the toilet because it takes three gallons of water to flush it one time. She thankfully has water now. Crews repairing the water system after dozens of mains broke through days of extreme cold. And in the west, a new storm sparking flash flooding in Southern California. First responders rescuing more than a dozen people in San Diego. Part of the 15 freeway shut down snarling traffic as much as three inches of rain falling in just three hours. From freezing to flooding, Trevor Alt is covering it all from New York for us now. Uh, Trevor, is there any hope on the horizon, at least for New Yorkers? So there is, but we're going to have to get through one last band here, Lindsay. So the storm that's over the heartland right now is expected to hit the northeast tomorrow, bringing rain and freezing rain with it. But after that, we have a winter warm up. Places, including New York City, could be near 60 degrees on Friday. And I, for one, am very happy to report that. Lindsay? And no winter hat for you then, Trevor Alds. Our thanks <laughs> to you. <laughs> and now let's get to ABC's chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, who's tracking it all for us. Hey, Ginger. There is so much to look at on this map. Let's start with it, Lindsay. We will go with the winter weather advisories from Topeka, Kansas to Scranton, Pennsylvania, right into the Poconos there, because in the next 24 hours, the system's going to move quickly and it's going to have a lot of different parts to it. Most of these advisories are for freezing rain. You saw all the images from Trevor's piece as to what that can do. That's when rain falls on a sub freezing surface, freezes on contact and makes that ice rink out of your roads or power lines. And the snow will be on the northern side. So much of New York, Western Massachusetts and Connecticut Connecticut gets a little hit by tomorrow night. A majority of the southern part is all rain and some of it heavy at times. And that's not just one round of rain, but multiple. And so there are places that desperately need it, like in Louisiana, where they're an exceptional drought in many spots, but they can get it so fast with five to eight inches right into the delta of Mississippi and back into southeastern Texas. Now, with the rounds of rain and damaging winds and even tornadoes down there is going to be a big pump of heat. And we're talking about actual heat. Like we could see parts of Florida Florida, who just had two hits of big cold, see record high temperatures by the end of the week somewhere near Orlando. A lot of us will be baking, or at least feeling like we are, into the 50s here in New York City as we go into the weekend, and the kick off the weekend in Washington, D.C., even in the low 60s. Quite a difference a week can make. Lindsay. It'll feel downright balmy there. Looking forward to that warm-up. Ginger Z, our thanks to you. The U.S. launched new airstrikes on Iranian-backed militants. It comes after a missile attack on a U.S. base in Iraq. ABC's foreign correspondent James Longman has those details. Tonight, U.S. and British forces launching another major attack on Iranian-backed militias at multiple targets across Yemen. They're aimed at stopping Houthi rebels' attacks on ships in the Red Sea. White House insists the strategy is working. The strikes that we have conducted ashore in Yemen have degraded Houthi capabilities. But so far, retaliatory airstrikes have failed to stop the Houthis. And it comes amid escalating tensions in the region. U.S. troops at Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq came under attack over the weekend. Iranian-backed militias fired 17 ballistic missiles and rockets. Most were intercepted. But the Pentagon says at least two U.S. personnel suffered traumatic brain injuries. It's just the latest in more than 150 attacks against U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria since October. And tonight, we're learning the identities of the two Navy SEALs who disappeared on that nighttime mission to seize these Iranian weapons headed to Houthi rebels. 37-year-old Christopher Chambers and 27-year-old Nathan Gage Ingram. After a 10-day search, the Pentagon now confirms the men are presumed dead. It uh, underscores how dangerous the mission can be um, and the dangers that these brave warriors are willing to face every day. James Longman joins us now. James, what targets did these strikes hit? 
Yeah, Lindsay, there were 30 strikes. They hit underground military storage sites. They've hit Houthi uh, missile and air surveillance capabilities. Uh, the U.S. and its allies are saying that this is all in order to de-escalate the situation. But you've got to remember, Saudi Arabia has been fighting a war against the Houthis for years. Many of these sites are exactly the same ones that the Saudis have been bombing, and yet the Houthis remain a powerful force. So we'll have to see if these strikes do indeed degrade Houthi capabilities the way the Pentagon says they will. Lindsay? James Longman for us. Thanks so much, James. The Supreme Court delivers a victory for the Biden administration in one of several heated immigration battles against the state of Texas. The court ruled federal agents can remove razor wire installed along the border of the, the southern border. ABC's senior national correspondent Terry Moran has more. Tonight, a narrowly divided Supreme Court delivering a victory for the Biden administration, clearing the way for federal agents to remove razor wire fencing installed by Texas along 29 miles of the southern border. In a 5-4 to four vote, the justices overturned an appeals court ruling that had blocked federal agents from removing the wire. The Biden administration had argued that the razor wire prohibited federal agents from carrying out their duties under immigration law, and that it's the federal government, not the states, that has primary responsibility under the Constitution for border enforcement. But lawyers for the state of Texas had argued that the wire, which had been installed on the orders of Texas Governor Greg Abbott, had been strategically positioned for the purpose of securing the border and stemming the flow of illegal migration, and accused federal agents of destroying the wire to help thousands of migrants to illegally cross the Rio Grande. ABC News was on the ground in September as Customs and Border Protection agents lifted or removed the wire as migrants arrived on the Texas side of the Rio Grande. Administration officials and immigration advocates have called the wire dangerous and inhumane. These graphic photos obtained by ABC News show some of the injuries caused by the wire, some requiring medical treatment. While the court's order today did not elaborate on the decision, four justices, Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Neil Gorsuch, and Brett Kavanaugh, voted to side with Texas and deny the Biden administration's request. Terry Moran joins us now. Terry, what comes next after today's decision? Well, Lindsay, this particular case will go back down to the lower courts, but really today's ruling is just the start of what's expected to be a major battle at the court this year in several cases uh, over the efforts by Texas and other states to assert more control over their international borders with the justice deciding these issues against the backdrop of a crisis at the border and the presidential election. Lindsay? Terry Moran for us reporting in from the nation's capital. Thanks so much, Terry. Today, a judge ordered to unseal the divorce case of the special prosecutor in Donald Trump's election case in Georgia. Nathan Wade, who is leading the prosecution of the former president, is accused of having an affair with the Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis. A defense attorney alleges the two were involved in an inappropriate relationship while prosecuting the election interference case. The judge has delayed Willis's deposition in Wade's divorce case. He said he would have a clearer understanding if D.A. Willis had unique knowledge that would make her testimony relevant after special prosecutor Wade is deposed in just over a week. Turning now to the Israel-Hamas war, tonight we take you inside a massive tunnel complex where up to two dozen hostages may have once been holed up. This is families of hostages stormed Israel's parliament. Here's ABC's Matt Gutman in Israel. As the IDF launches its biggest offensive in weeks, tonight family members of the more than 100 hostages still held in Gaza storming a finance committee meeting of the Israeli parliament demanding they act to bring them home, slamming the desk and shouting, now. The lawmakers sitting there stunned in a moment highlighting the growing pressure on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who reportedly rejected a deal presented by Hamas to end the war in exchange for their release. The IDF taking us into Han Yunus in recent days, a set of tunnels beneath this house where the military says some 20 hostages were held. We descend the stairs. There's a half mile straight away, a series of turns. So at this point, we're gonna have to mount. get with our hands and knees to get through here. It opens up to a vaulted room, tiled and plastered. Then beyond, those cells, a mattress, pillow, and a toilet. On this side right here, is a canister that is used or was used to hold an RPG warhead. Not far from where the IDF took us, Han Yunus has been crammed with many of the nearly 2 million Palestinians displaced in fighting in northern Gaza, thousands again on the move, fleeing southward. 
And with the Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry reporting the death toll topping 25,000, we asked the IDF... Do all Palestinians in Gaza then have to pay because of what Hamas did? We do not see collective punishment, but Hamas embeds himself using them as a human shield. Unfortunately, this tragedy creates this loss of life. Matt Gutman joins us from Israel tonight. Matt, what are you hearing from a senior Israeli official about where their priorities stand as the war wages on? The official, Lindsay, told me that the hostages cannot be brought home without negotiations, but this puts Israel in a bit of a bind, he said, and he acknowledged that Israel's war aims of both dismantling Hamas and freeing the hostages are competing because destroying Hamas will take many months and time, given the conditions the hostages are being held in, is not something they have, which is why he said we're starting to see this renewed momentum right now for negotiations. Lindsay. All right, Matt Gutman reporting once again for us from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much, Matt. The younger son of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Corinna Scott King has died after battling prostate cancer. Dexter Scott King was 62 years old. In a statement, his wife said that he died peacefully in his sleep. King dedicated his life to continuing work within the civil rights movement to honor the legacy of his parents. He was the third of King's four children and was named after the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, where his father served as a pastor. Turning now to your voice, your vote, one of the Capitol Police officers who defended the U.S. Capitol against rioters on January 6th is now running for Congress. And joining us to discuss his campaign is Harry Dunn, who resigned as a Capitol officer just last month. Harry, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and talking with us. Uh, we know that you're running as a Democrat to represent Maryland's third congressional district, which includes several counties outside of Baltimore. First and foremost, just share with us why you decided that you wanted to run. You know, thanks for having me on. It's always good to talk with you. But, um, you know, ever since, you know, it's what, been three years now since the whole January 6th um, attack on this nation, um, I've been working as hard as I can to seek out accountability and fight for justice and the preservation of our uh, democracy and our Constitution. I've been doing that um, in a public capacity for the last three years. And I feel like I've done all that I can do in the role that I've been in as a Capitol Police officer in the furtherance of that fight. Um, I love the saying that until there's nothing that can be done, there's always something that can be done. Mm. And it's, you know, it's, it's no exaggeration to say that we are still under a threat of our democracy no longer existing. And um, once Mr. Sarbanes, who represents the 3rd District now, announced that he is not seeking election, um, that created a real opportunity for me to do even more. Um, so I thought, what better way that to continue my um, my mission of public service, which I've been doing the last 15 plus years? Um, what better way to continue that than to um, to seek election to represent the people of the third district of Maryland? You delivered, of course, some memorable testimony before the House Committee, uh, which investigated the attack and, and called the pro-Trumper uh, rioters terrorists. Uh, you've also written a book about your experiences from that day. Uh, tell us what happened on January 6th that has really shaped your campaign. You know, I, I don't necessarily know if it's like shaped my campaign. I just, you know, I Obviously, on January 6th, I was a police officer and I did my job. I did just like so many brave men and women from the Capitol Police and Metropolitan Police. They did their jobs that day. But everything that I've done afterwards, I don't view it as me being a police officer. I just view it as me being a, a, an American citizen who cares about his country, who loves his country, who hates the direction that it is headed. And having a front row seat to the events of January 6th and serving at the place where members of Congress, um, you know, Donald Trump subordinates are attempting to whitewash everything that happened um, and, and just basically give him a free pass for it. Uh, I've been at the front seat, being at, at a servant at the table, um, watching them, it, it's, it's kind of fueled me to this moment that, um, that we're in right now. And, and, you know, if January 6th didn't happen, surely you and I aren't sitting here having this conversation at this moment. But January 6th did happen. And, um, you know, I, I, there's an opportunity for me to have a seat at the table and not just watch now. What do you feel is the biggest challenge Congress is facing right now? Stability. 
You know, look look how long we we went without having a speaker elected. Look how long it took uh, former Speaker McCarthy to get elected, and now current speaker that we have right now. You know, it, there's no stability in Congress. I think people want to feel secure and they want a sense of stability, and we're not getting that in Congress right now. What whether for whatever reason. Um, you know, just just in the talks of all the uh, the border security that's going on, that's that the House is currently fighting over with the Senate. Um, you know, having reached an agreement, what are we doing now? There's no stability in 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 government. Um, we're we're steadily passing stopgap uh, spending bills, short bills instead of long term funding. We can't even get that done. So I just think people want stability and security um, and, and representation. In Congress, you know, I, I've been a public servant, and that's, you know, I may not be a, a public official, um, excuse me, a career public official, but I'm a career public servant, and I've been doing that my whole life. And listening to people and giving them a voice is something that I think I'll be fantastic at. If you are uh, to be elected, what would you say is the first thing you want to accomplish? Wow, there's so many things that I, I definitely want to tackle. Um, you know, I've been pounding the pavement since day one about mental health and any and all legislation that we can form and uh, bring to the forefront for mental health, um, reducing the stigma, making it more available and accessible for individuals who need it is something that I definitely want to take care of. I also want to tackle uh, prison reform. There's so many things that the, uh, especially nowadays, since it appears to have the, um, the MAGA faction of the Republican Party's attention, they've been using the term hostages to refer to prisoners from January 6th. It seems like prison reform is something that they would be willing to talk about now. Uh, people of marginalized communities and um, colored communities have been screaming about uh, the criminal justice reform that is needed and necessary for so long. But um, it's kind of a shame that they only want to bring light to it now that it's affecting the people that they their supporters, their voters. But that's something I would love to sit down and have a talk about. Harry Dunn, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you talking with me tonight. Thank you so much. Any, any voters can find out more about my campaign. Um, Harry Dunn for Congress, F-O-R, congress.com. Thanks for um, having me. Thank you. And still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. The potential new evidence in the Scott Peterson case. A former investigator speaks for the first time since the Los Angeles Innocence Project went public with their effort to clear the convicted killer. Why the FAA is recommending hundreds more Boeing planes be inspected. But next, hearing from New Hampshire voters just hours before the first votes are cast. Raise your hand if you're an undecided voter. I've changed my mind about a dozen times so far. <laughs> Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I hug you. 
Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone, and back to the race for the White House and the first in the nation primary set for tomorrow in New Hampshire. Our Zareen Shah sat down with the voters in the fiercely independent live free or die state to take their temperature on what issues matter most to them and that all important question some are still pondering with less than 24 hours to go, which candidate they'll support. I love you, New Hampshire. For decades, New Hampshire has been the first primary in the country. Retail politics, the name of the game here in the live free or die state. And as ever, independent voters loom large at this early make or break moment in the primary season. We sat down with six highly engaged voters we met at campaign events around New Hampshire. How many events have all of you been to? Okay, at least 30, 35 maybe. Yeah, probably 30. Uh, probably 25. Raise your hand if you're an independent voter. Independents make up over 40% of New Hampshire voters. And on election day, they can request a Republican or Democratic ballot. We're the middle child, you know, that keeps peace in the family. And despite just a few oh, yeah. left to choose yeah, from. Say, we ran out of candidates, they all dropped out. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> some are still on the fence I at the 11th hour. Understand. Raise your hand if you're an undecided voter. I've changed my mind about a dozen times so far. <laughs> These voters telling us issues that matter the most to them. But when you speak to the average Absolutely. working class voter, they have increasing debt. Uh, they have the, everything has become more expensive for them, mm -hmm. and, and that's what they're feeling. The candidate courting these undecided voters the hardest, Nikki Haley. Can you hear that sound? That's the sound of a two-person race. Haley's team is making a major play for independence. We're getting conservatives, we're getting moderates, we're getting independents. But with the GOP field down to two, can the strategy be a winning one? Historically, um, if you're betting your campaign success on independent voters voting in a party primary for you, you're, you're fighting uphill and then some. Is this state a must win for her? If Haley's not able to put together a win here, I think then you have to ask, well, where's her next best shot? Haley is down roughly 10 points to Trump, a number that could change after Florida Governor Ron DeSantis suspended his campaign. If we don't have a clear path to victory. Accordingly, I am today suspending my campaign. And even though the Republican contest is the competitive one, some on our panel are considering voting Democrat this year. Who is going to pull a Republican ballot? Four people are going to pull a Republic, Republican ballot. Who's going to pull a Democratic ballot? So two people still figuring it out. The candidate they are considering may surprise you. I'm leaning toward Dean Phillips. I'm leaning towards Dean Phillips. Biden and the DNC removed the president's name from the New Hampshire ballot because they wanted the more diverse South Carolina to be first this time. Phillips is polling 50 points behind Biden in New Hampshire, and the delegates won't even count. You all ready for some change? You all ready? But it's possible Dean Phillips' numbers could raise eyebrows. Is Joe Biden about to get embarrassed in this state on Tuesday? I think so. I see almost everyone nodding. My vote for Dean is against Biden. The other three voters are split between Trump, Haley, and our sixth person is now undecided. Four years ago in the general election, four of these voters backed Trump. One for Biden, the last a third party candidate. One thing this group does seem to agree on. I think yeah. President Trump is going to win. I think after New Hampshire, I think if he wins the state, Nikki Haley has to win it in order for it to continue. But if she loses the state and Ron DeSantis loses, the election's over. Who agrees with Cooper? Who thinks that Donald Trump is going to win on Tuesday? I don't want him to win, but I think it's wishful thinking that he's not. But <laughs> That's the one thing I think that everyone agrees on. Does it feel like this country is angrier right oh, now oh, yeah. than it oh, was oh, before? Oh. Unlike parts of the country, after the 2020 election, this group seemingly at peace with their deep differences. Sitting here today with very divergent opinions about who we're supporting, but be, we were all civil. Whatever candidate gets elected, we have to find a way to converse with each other in a civil mm -hmm. manner Absolutely. and respect other people. Everybody here, everybody in this country is right to vote for who they want. 
We'll all be watching how it plays out tomorrow. Our thanks to Zareen for that. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, history made on the hardwood. The coach who broke an all-time record in basketball. But next, many of the most recent biggest blockbuster movies are female-driven. We go by the numbers to look at why. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Look up. There's got to be something out there. We were shocked. Scared to death. Oh, wow. My name is Kat Patterson, and I am an alien abductee. Extraterrestrial intelligence? Aliens? We are getting closer to the gravel road that is supposed to lead us to Area 51. OK. <laughs> are we alone? It's about time now to find out the answer. Aliens. Are we alone? Now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from Atlanta, I'm Steve Oshinsami. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Blockbuster hits from male-dominated movies seem to be rather hard to come by these days. This past summer, we saw a slew of testosterone-driven franchise movies all vying to be the next Top Gun Maverick. Movies like Transformers, Rise of the Beasts, Indiana Jones, and The Dial of Destiny, and the latest Mission Impossible installment. But they all came up short or outright tanked. So tonight, a look at Hollywood's apparent dude slump by the number since ladies seem to be having their day at the box office. Barbie and her pinky 
heels came onto the big picture in July 2023. And in the five months that followed, the only domestic hits in theaters have all been fueled by women, starting with Margot Robbie as Barbie. The flick raked in $155 million on opening weekend in the U.S., making it Warner Brothers' highest grossing global release ever in the studio's 100-year history. Let's not forget, it was also female-directed. Since then, the only other big domestic hits in theaters also have some serious girl power behind them. Taylor Swift, the Eras Tour, grossed $93.2 million its opening weekend back in October. It was the highest grossing concert film in U.S. box office history. Then you have leading lady Rachel Zegler in The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, which debuted right before Thanksgiving. It crossed the $100 million mark in its global debut. And while male-dominated movies like Ferrari and Boys in the Boat brought in less than a combined $9 million on their opening days, according to Box Office Mojo, that's a lot less in earnings when you pit them up against the Color Purple readaptation, which brought in $18 million on day one. Of course, we'll have to look ahead to tomorrow to see who's leading Hollywood, the men or the women, at least when it comes to Oscar nods. ABC News Live will bring you live coverage of the Oscar nominations tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Eastern. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. The Stanley Cup craze sweeping the country has some taking some drastic measures. And platinum certified singer, songwriter Chelsea Cutler is here in the studio with all the details on her latest project. wherever news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The FAA is asking airlines to take a fresh look at Boeing planes, stolen Stanley Cups, and history in college basketball. These stories and much more in tonight's rundown. A house fire in South Bend, Indiana, left five children dead, according to officials. Fire crews responded to a call on a residential street and continued to fight the fire for three hours. Firefighters found several of the children trapped on the second floor and were able to get them out as the house was engulfed in flames. Five of them later died from their injuries. A sixth child was taken to a nearby hospital and is being treated for burns. The cause of the fire is under investigation. The FAA is recommending nearly 400 additional Boeing models be inspected. This is a different type of aircraft than the 737 MAX 9, where the door plug fell out of an Alaska flight a few weeks ago mid-flight, but it has the same door plug design. Now officials want operators of the 737-900ER to make sure the door plugs are properly secured. The planes are flown by Alaska, Delta, and United Airlines. The airlines say they've already begun the inspections. Police in Roseville, California, responded to a call of a person attempting to steal thousands of dollars worth of Stanley Cups from a store. Police caught up with the suspect on the highway and found 65 Stanley products worth at least a couple thousand dollars stashed in the trunk. Authorities are charging the 23-year-old with grand theft and DUI. The Stanley Cup craze has swept the country in recent weeks with people waiting hours to get their hands on one. It's not even close to July 4th, but downtown Los Angeles residents were subjected to a late-night barrage of illegal pyrotechnics around 11 p.m. Witnesses say the impromptu display lasted about five minutes. LAPD said it was a coordinated and planned show, noted that it took place across the street from a federal facility. The department said they're investigating and looking for suspects. New Jersey resident Steve Murrow is every cat's hero. The professional tree climber has taken on a side job, rescuing cats who find themselves up a tree. He says it all began a few years ago when a friend asked him to help a cat stuck in a tree with no one around to help. Since then, he's continued his journey to rescue as many felines as he can. Last year, he rescued 39 cats from tall trees. Murrow says whenever he rescues a cat, his services are free. And Stanford women's basketball coach is making history. Coach Tara Vanderveer is now the all-time winningest coach in college basketball history. Vanderveer has been a head coach for nearly five decades. She began as a head coach when she was 24 years old. Vanderveer has won three NCAA titles with Stanford, also coached the 1996 U.S. women's basketball team to a gold medal at the Atlanta Olympics. New developments in the Scott Peterson case. A former California fire official who says key evidence wasn't properly investigated is speaking exclusively to ABC News for the first time since the Los Angeles Innocence Project took on the case. ABC's Kana Whitworth is back with this story. An ABC News exclusive. A former fire investigator speaking for the first time since that bombshell filing in the Scott Peterson case about the potential of new evidence. This has always been one of those things that kind of sits in the back of your head and kind of bugs you a little bit and you kind of wonder why this didn't happen or why it wasn't brought up. Nearly two decades after Scott Peterson was convicted of murdering his pregnant wife, Lacey, the Los Angeles Innocence Project demanding the case be reevaluated, largely hinging on information from then Modesco fire investigator Brian Spitolsky. Spitolsky investigating this burned out van found the morning after Lacey disappeared in December 2002 located less than a mile from the Peterson home. Lawyers from the Los Angeles Innocence Project now zeroing in on evidence from a mattress in the back of that van with a red and brown stain on it. You have this woman, she's eight months pregnant, she's missing, this van is of high interest, and now a sample from a mattress on that van has tested presumptive positive for blood 
What were you thinking in that moment? You know, I don't know that I was tying the moment to Lacey. I was more tying the moment that it was human blood. It made it like this was much more important than just a, a burned vehicle that somebody was just wanting to get rid of or cover up a, a simple crime. In a court filing, lawyers say DNA testing done on a small portion of that mattress several years later was insufficient to determine whether DNA from Lacey or their unborn son was present. You feel strongly that this evidence should be reassessed? Absolutely, especially if we've got sample that can still be tested. Lacey's disappearance captivated the country. Suspicion against Scott already mounting when his then-girlfriend, Amber Fry, came forward about their affair. Prosecutors later arguing Scott's motive for killing Lacey was for a $250,000 life insurance policy. A jury, siding with the prosecution in 2004, convicting Scott of first-degree murder for the death of Lacey and second-degree murder for the death of their unborn son, Connor. I don't have a, an agenda or an opinion on his guilt or his innocence. This is, for me, it's a, uh, a fire investigation in a vehicle that has blood, possible blood, you know, um, on the mattress. And that right there is important. Former ABC News investigative producer Mike Gudgel has followed the case from the beginning. I think it's still a mystery. You know, the trial uh, verdict uh, was sort of unsatisfactory. It, it didn't say what really happened to Lacey. Um, and I think even the prosecution conceded that during the trial. Brian Spatulski now works as a private fire investigator, but says the case has left a mark on him. Is this the one that sometimes keeps you up at night? Absolutely. Still so many questions all those years later. Our thanks to Kena for that. Tributes are pouring in after the death of acclaimed director Norman Jewison. He was known for his versatility and ability to get the best performances out of his actors. He directed film classics like In the Heat of the Night, Moonstruck, and Fiddler on the Roof. He was a seven-time Oscar nominee and earned an Academy Award for Lifetime Achievement in 1999. Norman Jewison was 97 years old. Now to the new personal finance trend that's being shared widely on social media media called loud budgeting. It's all about broadcasting your savings goals to help you make smarter choices and reduce impulse buys. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze has the details. Fast on the heels of the quiet luxury trend inspired by shows like Succession. She brought a normal sort of you handbag. You are a laughing stock in polite society. Comes a new financial trend making a very different kind of statement. It's not I don't have enough. It's I don't want to spend. Loud budgeting. We're doing drinks or dinner. We're not doing both. People taking to social media to broadcast their spending goals and limits. Oh, sorry, I can't. I don't want to spend $100 going out to dinner with you when I could put $100 in my high yield savings account. It holds you accountable, but also it allows the people that care about you to also hold you accountable. This TikTok video viewed more than one and a half million times, resonating with people who are tired of staying quiet about their finances. My friend wants to go out to dinner. I'm gonna, just gonna text them loud budgeting this month. I think financial transparency with your friends is something that you don't have to be embarrassed about. With home prices up 4% and food costs still 3% higher than a year ago, financial expert Tiffany Aliche says loud budgeting can help you cut back on impulse buying. Budgeting out loud is not just also the words, but it's also having these tools in place. Her loud budgeting tool, using a deactivation sticker on your credit card. It lists what you're saving money for, like a big trip, stopping you from making unnecessary purchases. Whenever I take out the card, it's a physical reminder because I'm budgeting out loud. Is this a need? Is this a love? Because if it's just a like or a want, then that's 10, 20, 30 less dollars that I can put toward my dream trip. Some helpful tips there, or thanks to Elizabeth Schulze. Platinum certified singer, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, and producer, engineer, so many multi-hyphenate here. Chelsea Cutler is out with a new album called Stellaria. Let's take a listen. That was the song, Your Bones, off our new album. Chelsea, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, how are you? I am well. So let's start out just a Stellaria. What does that mean? 
Um, well, firstly, I'm recovering from watching myself kiss someone on uh, television. <laughs> we uh, couldn't really tell. It was kind of yeah, it's off. It's, yeah, it's, it's very. Geek. Thank God, it's a very <laughs> un, uh, unfortunate angle. You we missed the whole thing. Uh, that worked out in our favor. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, for me, the last couple years, kind of especially post pandemic, has really just revolved around kind of falling back in love with life. I think it was really easy to. to develop like all these habits that probably were great coping mechanisms in the middle of COVID and not so great now. And um, and yeah, so Solaria, I studied Latin, which is really embarrassing and nerdy, um, but it means star-like and it also is Latin name for chickweed. And um, I don't know, I was just like, what a beautiful thing that gets so overlooked. And hmm. we kept, we went out west to shoot content. We went to like Jackson Hole and uh, kind of like around Yellowstone and we kept seeing the word Solaria pop up. There's mm. like a Solaria Creek and a Solaria Lane. And I don't, the word just really stuck with me and it felt like it, it just felt like it fit. And tell us like how you decide what you're gonna even write about. Cause it seems like a lot of it is, is about loving and going with it and being vulnerable, not just with someone else, but, but also with yourself. Yeah, I mean, I think I just, I just write about how honestly I'm feeling it on any particular mm. day, I think. Kind of the beauty of making an album is, you know, for two years or however long you spend making it, you kind of wake up every day and say, I'm gonna write a song about how I feel today and pick the best, you know, 15 or so of them. And a lot of times women, we don't see them as, as engineers, as, as producers. What do you think needs to change within the music industry for it to become more inclusive? I mean, that's a great question that probably would, we could sit here and talk for a really long time about, I mean, I, I think a lot of things, you know, I think uh, visibility is a big thing. I think, you know, culturally, a lot of the times, you know, in my experience, at least, you know, men are kind of encouraged to pursue more technical careers, if you will. You know, it's, I think it's kind of similar to the fact that, um, you know, there's a lot of like emphasis on, on like bringing more women into like STEM. You know, I, I just think a computer, you know, it's very computer and like tech heavy. And um, I don't know, there's, you know, growing up, like I was never encouraged to go to production school mm. or, or, you know, I was encouraged to take piano lessons and learn how to sing. And um, so I think, yeah, I think visibility and kind of changing the narrative around it is really, really important. So how did you start dabbling? Honestly, a means to an end. Um, I just feel like I hear in my head how I want a song to be. And the easiest way to bring that to life is to do it. And I'm really impatient. I don't know if that's an ADHD thing <laughs> or just I'm impulsive, but if I hear something, I want to make it right then and there. I don't want to wait to explain it to someone else or... So I, I just figured, I don't know, I figured out how to do it. Well, you're about to start your tour. Give us a sense of what fans can expect and where they can find you. We are, I think it's a really cool show. Yeah, I mean, I like to think, you know, performing's like my favorite thing to do. It's like one of the only things in life I'll say I'm fairly decent at. Um, but yeah, we're going to Charlottesville. I think, I think that's sold out, weirdly enough, because we've never been there before. I have no idea what to expect. It's all those UVA students. You gotta give me all the Charlottesville wrecks, <laughs> where to go, all the good I'll, stuff. I certainly will do that. Well, I know your fans are clamoring, clearly already sold out in a place that you haven't been uh, before. Uh, but thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate your time and your talent. And we want our viewers to know that you can listen to Chelsea Cutler's latest album, Stellaria, on streaming platforms and purchase tickets to her upcoming tour for those locations which are not sold out yet on ChelseaCutler.com. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, why children may just be playing youth sports a bit less. And our own Diane Macedo joins us to help us all figure out a better way to sleep. 
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Look up. There's got to be something out there. We were shocked. Scared to death. Oh, wow. My name is Kat Patterson, and I am an alien abductee. Extraterrestrial intelligence? Aliens? We are getting closer to the gravel road that is supposed to lead us to Area 51. Okay. <laughs> are we alone? It's about time now to find out the answer. Aliens, are we alone? Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including the race for the Republican presidential nomination converges onto the Granite State. Can Nikki Haley pull off a win with Ron DeSantis now out of the race? We'll have all the political coverage tonight with the polls opening just hours from now. Plus, the bone-chilling temperature is still gripping much of the country as flooding hits the West Coast where rescues had to be conducted. And dozens of people are still missing after a land slide in southern China. At least two people were killed, according to state media. But we do begin with the first in the nation, New Hampshire primary, just hours away and the race to the finish in a GOP campaign that is now down to just two, Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. And tonight, many are saying the live free or die state may be do or die for Nikki Haley. Haley has been barnstorming the state for weeks, trying to win over voters and make the case that she is the only one who can beat Biden. But polls still have her down more than 10 points to former president and Trump in New Hampshire. This has become a two-person race, as Haley likes to put it, between a fella and a lady after Florida Governor Ron DeSantis dropped out on Sunday and then endorsed Trump. Trump has been telling crowds in New Hampshire to expect a victory so decisive that it ends the primary. So what are the keys to winning in New Hampshire? Our team is standing by to break it all down. And we begin with our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, on the trail in New Hampshire. Kirsten, it's nice to meet you. Tonight in New Hampshire, it's do or die for Nikki Haley. She wanted a one on one matchup with Donald Trump, and now she's got it. So we're going to do this. Get out tomorrow. Take five friends with you. In the final hours, Haley crisscrossing the state with New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu. 
It is now a two-person race. And what that means is, your decision tomorrow is, do we want more of the same? Or do we want a new generational leader? Haley insisting Trump and President Biden are just too old for the job. And she's seizing on this moment. Trump confusing her with Nancy Pelosi when talking about January 6th. Nikki Haley is in charge of security. We offered her 10,000 people, soldiers, National Guard, so whatever they want. Haley pounced. When you're dealing with the pressures of a presidency, we can't have someone else that we question whether they're mentally fit to do this. Trump, meantime, has turned to mocking Haley's Indian first name, Nimrata, highlighting it and misspelling it again and again. It's a little bit of a takeoff on her name, you know, her name, wherever she may come from. Haley was born in South Carolina. She told me Trump's attacks are proof she's getting to him. This is what he does when he starts to feel insecure. This is what he does when he feels threatened. One thing is clear. With Florida Governor Ron DeSantis out of the race, Haley is now the only candidate standing between Trump and the Republican nomination. And here in New Hampshire, she's counting on independent voters like Deborah Barubi, a cook at a hospital. She tells me she's undecided, but... It's probably going to be Nikki. Why Nikki? Because I think it's time for a big change. <laughs> Huge. So why not Trump? After all he's done now, we don't need it. Lindsay, Nikki Haley is betting on a strong showing in this state, but she's still trailing former President Donald Trump by double digits. She told me that win or lose here in New Hampshire, she's going on to her home state of South Carolina. Lindsay, that's still more than a month away. Lindsay. Rachel, thank you. Our in-depth coverage and analysis of the New Hampshire primary begins tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live. And now to the deadly winter storms across the country as we track yet another, a new system moving east. Snow, ice, and record cold are already blamed for at least 75 deaths in 13 states this month alone. Rescuers saved a driver who skidded off the road, leaving his pickup truck dangling over a 200-foot cliff outside of Nashville. And heavy rain caused flash flooding in San Diego with up to three inches falling in the span of three hours. Our chief meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking what comes next. But first, Trevor Alt leads off our storm coverage. Tonight, that 28 ton fire truck spinning out of control on icy roads near St. Louis. Oh my God. Watch again firefighters responding to a call, losing traction, striking a vehicle, and coming to a stop. Luckily, no one was hurt, but that dangerous ice storm is making travel treacherous across the heartland. AccuWeather capturing streets covered in ice outside Oklahoma City. The back roads, especially, are incredibly slick. There's about a quarter inch of ice accretion that happened overnight from multiple waves of freezing rain. On Lake Erie, east of Toledo, a race to rescue 20 people stranded on an ice floe a half mile from shore. The Coast Guard and local authorities rushing to the scene, everyone making it back to land safely. But tragically, the death toll rising from weeks of winter storms. At least 75 people killed across 13 states, many from hypothermia and car crashes. In Memphis, where a boil water advisory remains in effect, residents like Carolyn Mayfield going several days without water. I'm literally going outside, getting snow, melting it, and putting it in the toilet because it takes three gallons of water to flush it one time. She thankfully has water now. Crews repairing the water system after dozens of mains broke through days of extreme cold. And in the west, a new storm sparking flash flooding in Southern California. First responders rescuing more than a dozen people in San Diego. Part of the 15 freeway shut down snarling traffic as much as three inches of rain falling in just three hours. From freezing to flooding, Trevor Alt is covering it all from New York for us now. Uh, Trevor, is there any hope on the horizon, at least for New Yorkers? So there is, but we're going to have to get through one last band here, Lindsay. So the storm that's over the heartland right now is expected to hit the northeast tomorrow, bringing rain and freezing rain with it. But after that, we have a winter warm up. Places, including New York City, could be near 60 degrees on Friday. And I, for one, am very happy to report that. Lindsay? And no winter hat for you then, Trevor Alt. Our thanks <laughs> to you. <laughs> and now let's get to ABC's chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, who's tracking it all for us. Hey, Ginger.
There is so much to look at on this map. Let's start with it, Lindsay. We will go with the winter weather advisories from Topeka, Kansas to Scranton, Pennsylvania, right into the Pocotos there, because in the next 24 hours, the system's going to move quickly, and it's going to have a lot of different parts to it. Most of these advisories are for freezing rain. You saw all the images from Trevor's piece as to what that can do. That's when rain falls on a sub-freezing surface, freezes on contact, and makes that ice rink out of your roads or power lines. And the snow will be on the northern side, so much of New York, western Massachusetts, and Connecticut it gets a little hit by tomorrow night. A majority of the southern part is all rain and some of it heavy at times. And that's not just one round of rain, but multiple. And so there are places that desperately need it, like in Louisiana, where they're an exceptional drought in many spots, but they can get it so fast with five to eight inches right into the delta of Mississippi and back into southeastern Texas. Now, with the rounds of rain and damaging winds and even tornadoes down there is going to be a big pump of heat. And we're talking about actual heat. Like we could see parts of Florida Florida, who just had two hits of big cold, see record high temperatures by the end of the week somewhere near Orlando. A lot of us will be baking, or at least feeling like we are, into the 50s here in New York City as we go into the weekend, and the kick off the weekend in Washington, D.C., even in the low 60s. Quite a difference a week can make. Lindsay. It'll feel downright balmy there. Looking forward to that warm-up. Ginger Z, our thanks to you. Overseas now, the U.S. launched new airstrikes on Iranian-backed militants. It comes after a missile attack on a U.S. base in Iraq. ABC's foreign correspondent James Longman has the details. Tonight, U.S. and British forces launching another major attack on Iranian-backed militias at multiple targets across Yemen. They're aimed at stopping Houthi rebels' attacks on ships in the Red Sea. The White House insists the strategy is working. The strikes that we have conducted ashore in Yemen have degraded Houthi capabilities. But so far, retaliatory airstrikes have failed to stop the Houthis. And it comes amid escalating tensions in the region. U.S. troops at Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq came under attack over the weekend. Iranian-backed militias fired 17 ballistic missiles and rockets. Most were intercepted. But the Pentagon says at least two U.S. personnel suffered traumatic brain injuries. It's just the latest in more than 150 attacks against U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria since October. And tonight, we're learning the identities of the two Navy SEALs who disappeared on that nighttime mission to seize these Iranian weapons headed to Houthi rebels. 37-year-old Christopher Chambers and 27-year-old Nathan Gage Ingram. After a 10-day search, the Pentagon now confirms the men are presumed dead. It uh, underscores how dangerous the mission can be um, and the dangers that these brave warriors are willing to face every day. Our thanks to James. The Supreme Court delivers a victory for the Biden administration in one of several heated immigration battles against the state of Texas. The court ruled federal agents can remove razor wire installed along the part of the southern border. ABC's senior national correspondent Terry Moran has more. Tonight, a narrowly divided Supreme Court delivering a victory for the Biden administration, clearing the way for federal agents to remove razor wire fencing installed by Texas along 29 miles of the southern border. In a 5-4 to four vote, the justices overturned an appeals court ruling that had blocked federal agents from removing the wire. The Biden administration had argued that the razor wire prohibited federal agents from carrying out their duties under immigration law, and that it's the federal government, not the states, that has primary responsibility under the Constitution for border enforcement. But lawyers for the state of Texas had argued that the wire, which had been installed on the orders of Texas Governor Greg Abbott, had been strategically positioned for the purpose of securing the border and stemming the flow of illegal migration, and accused federal agents of destroying the wire to help thousands of migrants to illegally cross the Rio Grande. ABC News was on the ground in September as Customs and Border Protection agents lifted or removed the wire as migrants arrived on the Texas side of the Rio Grande. Administration officials and immigration advocates have called the wire dangerous and inhumane. These graphic photos obtained by ABC News show some of the injuries caused by the wire, some requiring medical treatment. While the court's order today did not elaborate on the decision, four justices, Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Neil Gorsuch, and Brett Kavanaugh, voted to side with Texas and deny the Biden administration's request. Terry Moran joins us now. Terry, what comes next after today's decision? Well, Lindsay, this particular case will go back down to the lower courts, but really today's ruling is just the start of what's expected to be a major battle at the court this year in several cases uh, over the efforts by Texas and other states to assert more control over their international borders with the justices deciding these issues against the backdrop of a crisis at the border 
and the presidential election. Lindsay? Terry Moran for us, reporting in from the nation's capital. Thanks so much, Terry. Turning now to the Israel-Hamas war, tonight we take you inside a massive tunnel complex where up to two dozen hostages may have once been holed up. This is families of hostages stormed Israel's parliament. Here's ABC's Matt Gutman in Israel. As the IDF launches its biggest offensive in weeks, tonight family members of the more than 100 hostages still held in Gaza storming a finance committee meeting of the Israeli parliament demanding they act to bring them home, slamming the desk and shouting, now. The lawmakers sitting there stunned in a moment highlighting the growing pressure on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who reportedly rejected a deal presented by Hamas to end the war in exchange for their release. The IDF taking us into Han Yunis in recent days, a set of tunnels beneath this house where the military says some 20 hostages were held. We descend the stairs. There's a half mile straight away, a series of turns. So at this point, we're going to have to get on our hands and knees to get through here. It opens up to a vaulted room, tiled and plastered. Then beyond, those cells, a mattress, pillow, and a toilet. On this side right here, is a canister that is used or was used to hold an RPG warhead. Not far from where the IDF took us, Han Yunus has been crammed with many of the nearly two million Palestinians displaced in fighting in northern Gaza, thousands again on the move, fleeing southward. And with the Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry reporting the death toll topping 25,000, we asked the IDF... Do all Palestinians in Gaza then have to pay because of what Hamas did? We do not see collective punishment, but Hamas embeds himself using them as a human shield. Unfortunately, this tragedy creates this loss of life. Matt Gutman joins us from Israel tonight. And Matt, what are you hearing from a senior Israeli official about where their priorities stand as the war wages on? Uh, the official, Lindsay, told me that the hostages cannot be brought home without negotiations. But this puts Israel in a bit of a bind, he said. And he acknowledged that Israel's war aims of both dismantling Hamas and freeing the hostages are competing. Because destroying Hamas will take many months and time. Given the conditions the hostages are being held in is not something they have. Which is why he said we're starting to see this renewed momentum right now for negotiations. Lindsay. All right, Matt Gutman reporting once again for us from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much, Matt. Now to the new report for parents on the dropout rate for youth sports. ABC's Ariel Reshev has more on the surprising numbers, the concern over fatigue, and how many sports is too many for young athletes. In the American Academy of Pediatrics issuing a new warning about youth sports, saying too much pressure on kids' performance is leading to overtraining, injuries, and burnout. Nice, Alex. In recent years, experts raising more concerns that overzealous parents can take the fun out for kids. When there's such an overemphasis on winning, it really takes away the enjoyment. The new study released overnight finds a whopping 70% of kids are dropping out of organized youth sports by age 13. Factors include depression, fatigue, sleep problems, and injuries. The AAP recommending youth athletes should take part in no more than one sport per day and have at least one day of rest per week from organized sports. And experts say the focus should not be on wins and losses. Parents can do a lot to support young people. It doesn't matter if they win or lose. It's that they're building um, their character and they're taking care of their bodies. Some helpful tips there from Ariel. Our thanks to her. And still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. The search for survivors after a landslide in China. Also, the sleep tips you need to know from our own Diane Macedo. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the 
the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live, streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Hit me with them good vibes, bitches on my phone lives. Everything is so fine, little bit of sunshine. Dance more, just a little bit. Breathe more, just a little bit. Smile a little more in a minute. Ah, 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 ah. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the Capitol, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Dozens of people are still missing after a landslide in southern China. At least two people were killed, according to state media. Rescue workers have been sifting through rubble and snowy sub-zero temperatures. Meanwhile, in western China, no deaths have been reported after a 7.1 magnitude earthquake was reported there. Life for women in Afghanistan has worsened over the past two years since the Taliban takeover. A new UN report finds that there's been a 5% drop in women's employment. The report also indicated that nearly 70% of Afghans, especially women, are not able to fulfill basic needs like food and health care. A spokesperson for the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan said the report was mostly based on a misunderstanding. And in Ecuador, the president there told police they are winning the battle weeks after a state of emergency was put into place to restore order. He announced violent deaths have dropped from 38 a day to six. During today's announcement, new equipment was also handed out to police in their fight against organized crime, which included bulletproof vests and robots for anti-explosive work. Being an anchor and journalist means sleep is always something we need more of. Between the long nights and early mornings, getting a good night's rest is certainly important. ABC News Live anchor Diane Macedo is no stranger to her share of sleep problems. Diane wrote the book The Sleep Fix, which explores her journey of insomnia and shares practical solutions. Now she has a new course, The Sleep Fix Method, and it takes a deeper dive into how to build those better habits. And joining us now, the anchor herself, Diane Macedo. Good to be sharing. <laughs> The desk with I you. know it's it, fun to be on this side of we it. We normally pass like like ships in the night, and you know we've had these conversations because I too have have suffered. I, I actually felt your book was a real big help for me. I'm so glad with getting a better night's sleep. So tell us how this course differs from what we can get as far as tips in the book. So uh, one, I think so many of us attribute our sleep problems to oh it's my schedule or it's just work or whatever, and we normalize problems that we shouldn't normalize because they are fixable, even though sometimes we're made to believe that they are. Aren't. And when I released the book, I got such a response from so many people saying, I mean, you're one of them, right? Saying, this book really helped me. This mm -hmm. book really changed me. And some of them were pretty dramatic. People saying, you know, I haven't had Ambien in eight months for wow. the first time in years because of your book. And so I thought, okay, this is... I'm onto something here, mm -hmm. you know, this is really helping people. But I also got flooded with a lot of questions of people asking about specific circumstances that they were dealing with. And some people who didn't want to read a 280, sure. you know, some odd page book about a comprehensive view of sleep problems in general and fixing them in general, when so many of them had the same problem. I struggle to fall asleep at night or I wake up at night and I struggle to fall back asleep. What specifically do I need? So I decided to create this course to give people, one, a different medium to get the information, more prescriptive information, you know, literally telling you step by step exactly what to do, and also to streamline it. So it, this is specifically for people who have, have that problem. I struggle to fall asleep at night or I wake up and I struggle to fall back asleep. This is the, a quick way for them to get those solutions and get those long-lasting results. And this is this question I know is going to sound like an oversimplified of a difficult problem, but in the end, what worked for you? I had to merge a few different things because I, for example, 
I think the biggest thing is to find out what's causing your sleep problems before you start throwing everything at it. Because you might think that, oh, if I just try all of the solutions, that will be the best thing because something will work. But when it comes to sleep, if we try too hard, it actually backfires on you. Mm. Because when you create this idea that there are all of these things you have to do in order to sleep well, sleep becomes a chore, something you have to do, something you have to work for rather than something you get to do. And that means now when you're going to bed, your brain's in work mode. Instead of unwinding and saying, oh, I know what's happening now, we're getting ready to go to bed, your brain's like, oh, I know what's happening now, we have to check off all of that stuff. And that often fuels insomnia, or if it already exists, it makes it worse. So you really want to, we, we want a scalpel here, not a sledgehammer. And so part of my mission with the Sleep Fix is to help people first pinpoint what's causing your sleep issues. And let me ask you a few questions, you know, and I do this in the course and in the book. Let me ask you a few questions to help you narrow down and describe to you a few different things. And you tell me what sounds familiar. Because from there, then we can steer you in the direction of, okay, here are a series of evidence-based solutions proven in clinical studies to be effective that are specifically aimed at that problem. And what that does is not only do you get results, but you get results without trying a million different things and making all these big sacrifices that you don't necessarily have to make. So you get those results without all the stress and without feeding into this problem that's already causing. And for me, circadian rhythm was a big one because of my schedule. So I learned some really practical tips to kind of shift my circadian rhythm, almost as if you are get preparing for jet lag. One of the surprising things I learned is you can accidentally train your brain through your behaviors to think you're supposed to be awake in bed. Mm -hmm. And that's why so many of us are dozing on the couch one second, oh, and all of a sudden amazing. you get in bed and you think, oh my goodness, I was just falling asleep. Why am I wide awake now? It's because your brain has learned that bed is a place, a stressful place where you need to be alert. So instead of winding down, it triggers your fight or flight response. If your routine consistently ends in you wide awake and frustrated, that routine will just continue to send the message that now it's time to be awake and frustrated. So you need to find the more practical solution for that problem. Diane, thank you thank so you, much Lindsay. for joining us. I want to let our viewers know her course, The Sleep Fix Method, is available on the site, thesleepfixmethod.com. And still to come, the group dishing out hope in these frigid times. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Fuzzy SOS is answered. To me, these are my angels. I told them they're my angels. Snow angels of a different sort who work with a national nonprofit organization called Eight Days of Hope. Our hope is just to love people and serve people and remove some of the challenges that they're going through right now with this heavy snowfall. The group responds to disasters across the country. And after lake effect snowstorms dumped more than five feet of snow on parts of Buffalo this past week, it was snowing here for days. I mean, we didn't get any breaks. The roof has so much snow on it, it's just coming down. It's just, I'm worried about my roof. These volunteers came to the rescue, clearing mounds of snow off sidewalks, driveways, even rooftops. Mentally, it feels great. Sometimes physically, we're a little sore, but you know. Despite the frigid temperatures, 
these residents have a warm spot for the volunteers and their willingness to dig in and help out. This is big. This is so big for me, for us, yeah, for the community, actually. I'm just so thankful that they have people that do this come out and help people. It feels good. It kind of gives a sense of purpose and also being able to uh, see the look in someone's eye when you've, you've helped them. Heartwarming in the midst of all that snow. And that is our show for tonight. And you can tune in tomorrow morning to see the announcement of this year's Oscar nominations. Our coverage begins at 8 a.m. right here on ABC News Live. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and, of course, abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.